Would you like to go ahead and get started? Okie doker. I got that and I believe we're ready to go. I'm going to wait. We are. It looks like that we may have lost Ward here for just a minute. There you are. You're back and connecting to audio and will lead us through this building needs assessment uh, webinar. So take it away, Ward. Let's see if, okay, here we go. Am I muted or am I good? No, we can hear you and we're okay. ready. You just tell me when you're ready for your PowerPoint. Well, let's get started. If you put one up right now, now do some introduction as to what we're doing. Uh, I got muted for a second and I saw Tracy Frederick, who is our Director of Strategy and Engagement, has been so helpful. We have a few tech people that are so helpful that we couldn't do any of this without them. And I think we're off to a better start than we were, were a month ago. I think we've got the glitches ironed out. But tonight's program is basically the basic needs assessment. And I'm going to go through some of these slides pretty quickly. You can read them and find them on our KSBR web, BRC website and read them and study them for yourselves. I wanna talk more about some of the practical aspects as we go through this that have been some successful for some schools. Uh, but first of all, the KSBRC does not, we don't call it charge for services. Our, my goal, since I've been involved with this, is simply to improve student achievement. And it really hit home with me last year. And on our website, uh, we have a man named Eric Crable who did our conference, our first conference for us in Wichita. And listening to him, I think every board member that's listening, every superintendent is listening, and we have quite an audience tonight, so I'm sort of excited. I'm glad we have superintendents as well as uh, school board members and a good number of you. Uh, but I would really suggest go to our website and, and watch Eric's presentation. And the best news of that today, one of our larger school districts in Kansas just hired that company to work with their school board to do just what we're talking about tonight. And, you know, that's thrilling. Uh, improving student achievement is so critical. The, my favorite comment, improving student achievement is by changing adult behavior. And we can't keep doing things the way we've always been doing them and plan on being successful. It's just not gonna happen. We have to make some changes in our adult behaviors. You know, I, was, I went to school board meetings for 20 years and I do not think that we ever spent more than five minutes, maybe in, in six months on student achievement. We talked about coaches and we talked about facilities, but really bearing down on what can we do to improve student achievement should be a key. Eric Crable says that the average board meeting is 10 minutes on student achievement. So I challenge all of you listening tonight, where are you guys in that status? Or, you know, is it 10 minutes? Do you ever talk about it? Uh, are there things that you need to know and don't know? The number of requests that I've had for like the building needs assessment, that's unbelievable. Kansas Open Gov has all of that. And I would think every superintendent would just share that with their board. You can go find everything you wanna know. I had a call today, they could not believe what they had in unencumbered funds. The second call today asked what encumbered funds was. I mean, if you're a school board member, you should know some of these things. So that is all up. Our district snapshots are now up and current on Kansas Open Gov. The ACT by district will be up in the next day or two. And that's gonna be an interesting thing to see. And we're not doing it to say you guys are bad and this school is better. We're saying take a look at these things and what can you do to improve student achievement? If you can find out good ways to do it and the building needs assessment is a great process on how you can actually do it. And if you'll follow the law, which it is a law and give me the next slide up. If you follow the law, you will see there are some things that are definitely uh, needed to be done. It may be the most important thing for every school board member to know. A basic strip for a strategic plan to approve, you have to have a plan. And I don't know any business that's successful that does not have a plan. Next slide. These are goals that you just basically have in any measurable situation. If you look at all those, smart, easy to remember, specific, 
And when they say specific, I've seen some schools write districts that you're going to improve 40 percent in a year. Not going to happen. You are lucky to improve five to 10 percent. If you check three or four times a year, the chances that you are going to improve go up more. The more you check, the more you improve. So it has to be relevant. Focus on your students, not your adults. And again, time bound. Find a, find a percentage that you would like to see. Next slide. I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but when you look every school district, you should look at your expectations and how you've written them. And so many, they're not, they're really nice words, but they're not really high expectations. What does that mean? I have high expectations every day, but if I don't measure exactly what I will get done, I don't get anything done. You have to have high expectations. You can look at those different results. Skip to the next slide. Everyone I talked to said, boy, it's all about money. And I have found looking at so many districts in the last year and a half, it's not all about money, it's how you spend the money. Everybody wants more money in this world. But the NAEP scores, and the other comment, again, I had in the last two days are people, we measure things that aren't important. Well, NAEP scores are a statistic that you can measure against everybody else. And there has to be some form of measurement to actually see where you are. So if you use these NAEP scores and take a look at them, you can see dollar-wise, we're spending more money now on education than we ever have. But it's never enough. I was in the legislature. I was at budget chairman. All I heard was, we need more money. We need more money. Guess what's happened? They have not gone up, and you've gotten more money. So wh what's the problem? I say the problem is you're not following the basic needs assessment. Let me have the next slide. Okay, ACT college readiness. Again, statistically, two out of 10 students graduating from Kansas colleges are ready for four-year college. Uh, if that is accurate, that is abysmal. Uh, I know personally, I have grandkids that started off in college in the last few years, had to take a remedial class. I mean, that's not what we should be doing to our students. So many students are taking so many hours. And I would say every school board member, if you have kids graduating from your school with 30 college hours, are they really college hours? That would be a great board member question to ask. Are these kids really getting trained to do college level work or are they just spending money to go to school for less years? We want kids to be able to learn. You can study this chart for yourself. Next chart, please. Okay, state assessments. Again, we hear the comment all the time, these scores aren't valid. These are directly off the State Department of Education's website. We don't make them up, but we're not trying to destroy anybody or say some school's terrible. I'm going to throw this out. We now have a state national school board for academic excellence. I was lucky to be the Kansas representative, California, Kansas, and uh, North Carolina are our three board members. We have our director from Florida. We have from sea to shining sea. The same problems are existing in every state. It's not like Kansas or our KSBRC just made up this stuff. We're fighting this nationwide. And I don't think anybody is dumb enough to think that it's just a Kansas problem. It's a national problem. But right now we're most concerned. I wanna solve the Kansas problem. And if you take a look at these, below grade level in 2015, 23% of our students were below grade level in 2015. Again, off the Kansas State Department of Education website, and that was in math. Take a look now in 2023. Now it's 33%. So someone told me the other day, the pandemic. Yep, that pandemic did a lot of bad things, but it was there and it's still affecting everybody in, in this world. So we need to find a way to overcome those things. We look at the English Learning, English Learning, English Language Associate, below grade level, 21% in 2015, 33%. That means basically three out of 10 third graders right now are reading below grade level. There is not a person in, an, in Kansas that would say that's acceptable. And I've seen where this basic needs assessment can be used to actually improve that. 
And I would challenge some of you guys that are listening to this tonight. If you would go into your elementary schools, and if you're a small school, you have one. If you're a big school, you might have eight. Every school has to be looked at individually. You can't just group these together like we have here. You have to look at each one of your schools individually, try to determine what, what obstacles are causing these problems there. But if you take a look at them, they can be solved. And what I found, one school district I went in, there were two first grade teachers, two second, two third, and you know what they said? Only one of them felt comfortable teaching reading. The building principal was shocked. The school board member that was there couldn't believe it. Superintendent didn't know that that had happened. I would really wish everybody in Kansas would go into their elementary schools. And I think we have some great teachers, but we need to sit down with that grade level and get those third graders up to great to reading level of proficient. There's a study that says if you are not reading at grade level by the time you end third grade, only 6% of those kids ever catch up. If you want to find a place to really focus in on your district, a very simple place is to simply look at that and determine what are the obstacles? What can you do? Are you teaching the science of reading? Are you teaching subjects? Do you have a reading curriculum? And again, I've, I've, I've talked to too many people. They don't even know what the reading curriculum is. Even some of the teachers don't know. I mean, it, it's something you should all really pursue. Next slide. Large achievement gaps. It's very evident in almost any school. But again, when you look at your building needs assessment, when you look at your uh, basic, basic needs, and you're looking at the district snapshot is the word I'm looking for, and you look at your schools, and you look at each school individually, you can look at this and find where the gaps are. And if you don't know where the gaps are, you can't find ways to identify how to get to those gaps. And I'm gonna throw, I've used this story a lot, but it's a fun story. These teachers that really weren't sure, the third grade teacher really knew how to teach reading. In a long story short, they took some of their money that they didn't think they had, and the board member said they did have. Anyhow, they got the money, they hired a, hired a third grade teacher as a reading specialist, and now she is working with all those other six teachers in the building to improve their reading scores. And, to spend, and they also, aligned their schedule where they were spending more time on reading. So they identified obstacles. They, here's the obstacles. This is why we're not doing well. We need to improve our teachers' skills in teaching reading. We need to spend more time on teaching reading. Along with that came another issue that a lot of the teachers will bring up. One student can completely destroy their ability to teach reading. And it's an obstacle. That one student might just never behave in it that they spend all their time talking to one student. As a district administrator or as the building administrator, look at that obstacle and say, what can we do? How can we help that situation? How can we help that teacher? But more importantly, how can we help that kid? The, you know, there's an, the other study <laughs> cracks me up. Most bullies that are identified, self-identified, read below the third grade level. That affects every kid in the school. So teaching that kid to read, spending the time. And I know a district right now that actually has parents coming in volunteering to take that one kid and sit down with them and take those minutes and try to really work with that student on what the teacher gives them to. And that kid's happier. He's catching up. The teacher's happier. They're working diligently with the kids in their class and everybody's reading score is going to go up. It's identify the obstacle, talk to your teachers. And the amount we need to sit down, the board is supposedly in charge of this. Go to the next slide, please. Here's the law, legal requirement in Kansas. So what I've alluded to so far this evening is some of the problems that we're facing, where the statistics might lead. But each year, the Board of Education of a district shall conduct an assessment. Well, right now, there's a big group that says, nope, that's not the law. Told superintendents they don't have to follow that. Well, wait a second. I don't, I don't know if, if that's really accurate that somebody's being told you don't have to follow that. Uh, there's a lot of laws I'd like to break. I'd speed 8590 when I'm going to Topeka, but I don't do that. 
because there is a law and the law says you shall conduct assessment of the educational needs of each attendance center. And it's not just handled by the superintendent handing you, this is what we're gonna do. Improvement will not change until adult behavior changes. The best school districts, and I guarantee it, you'd love all love to be one. The school board, the superintendent, the principals, the teachers, the parents are all on the same page working diligently together. But if you don't focus in on a problem, you can't work together. Yeah, we oh, our reading scores are low, or our math scores are low, or our kids aren't prepared in this. Okay, if that's the case, why? What's the obstacle? Focus in on it. Everybody work together. Sit down, get input from your teachers, and you'll be amazed if you actually ask your teachers sometimes. They know the answers, but they don't feel like their voice might be heard. So again, as a school board member, I mean, I've been told, I've been told by school board members they're not allowed in an elementary school, or they're not allowed to talk in an open meeting, or they're not allowed to do this. I would look very strongly at your board policy and get some of those things changed. It has to be the board has to drive. You hired the superintendent. We have some great superintendents in Kansas. I talk to them a lot. And they are doing some wonderful things with some tremendous, tremendous problems that they're facing. Society has changed so much each year. It's harder and harder. Uh, teacher shortages. But you know what? In some of the school districts that are really good, they don't have teacher shortages. And they don't have any problem hiring new teachers because they know when they go there, there's going to be good discipline. They have a curriculum that they actually can follow and that they're all on the same page trying to get these kids to improve. I'm gonna come back down to saying, this is a state law. I can't anybody believe anybody is telling you that you don't have to follow it. And if check with your lawyer, but that's the law. Next slide. <laughs> I get fired up, folks. You'll have to answer it. Okay, answer three questions each school. Talking about some of these tonight. What are the barriers preventing students from being proficient in reading and math? It might be as simple as your teachers aren't skilled in it and they need a little boost. They need That's an easy fix. What budgetary changes are needed? Again, the money is usually there, not always. But if you really identify the obstacles, you can move things around and make things work. And that's when... If a board member's involved in this, they can insist that they want to see the budget. They want to see the figures. Again, I can't believe some board member might not know what you have in an unencumbered fund. If you're a small district and have $3 million in unencumbered funds, you can afford another teacher to help reading. Uh, some of the school districts are using some of that money to keep good teachers. There's lots of things you can do. I'm not going to tell you how to do them. This is the process that's been developed that you are to take a look at. You determine these situations. I'm trying to throw out ideas tonight and we have outlines for you to follow. It'll be on our website. But if you would take this process and use a school board member, the superintendent, the principal. I, I had great luck in one school district with a custodian. He, he was so upset that the rooms were so sloppy every night. One meeting, the rooms aren't sloppy anymore. I mean, everybody in that district has to work together. So what changes, when changes are implemented, how many years to proficient and or below grade level? Honestly, in reading and math, if you would start at the third grade level and see how many years it would take to get 10 out of 10 kids up to grade level, you're not gonna do it this year. Incremental changes, each year identify it. And in my belief, <coughs> if everybody on the same page in your district is together, in three years, you can have this accomplished in both subject areas. And you know the benefits if you get your lower kids up the level, they stay in school, they keep improving as they go through school, they might go technical, they might go college, but they have a chance. If you don't catch the kids in this situation, they don't have a chance. <coughs> and we need kids to have a chance. Next slide. Going fast, okay. Most districts don't follow the law. I mean, and honestly, I cannot tell you one district that is completely following the law as written. And maybe it's because you're being told you don't have to do it. Uh, but you don't answer the required questions that are there. Many districts contend board members don't have to participate. 
They just review the staff prepared reports. You know, again, improving student achievement cha by changing adult behavior. If we don't make those changes in school, look where we are. We can't continue to always be doing the things the way we're doing them. If you got on the board, you have a one, follow a state law, you shall, but you also, there should be a want. And I'm hoping that we can see wants in every school districts in Kansas where everybody just starts pulling together to get these kids up to snuff. Okie doke, next, next one. Now, taking charge, how can we do this? Next one. Okay, it's a legal obligation for board members. You can tell the district staff to schedule meetings with each school, provide the supplies and support, white whiteboard, something where you can write things. What are the obstacles? What can we do? Getting input. Different staff may attend to observe. I'm, they certainly should be there. I mean, they have to answer questions and know what's going on. <clears throat> and the, the example I'm giving, if you're shocked that your third grade teachers don't know how to teach reading, so you aren't doing your job real well. I mean, you should take a look at that and find out, you know, God, what, uh, what have I done wrong? Am I talking to my teachers about these things? And when they say board members run the meetings, they can sit there and simply say, identify, identify, identify. Just being present, just being present and showing staff that you support what they're doing. And then at, you just, you don't have to know all the answers. I had a board member ask me last week, well, I don't know how to teach reading. You don't have to know how to teach reading, but you can ask a question like, how many of you first grade teachers are feel really comfortable teaching reading? That's a simple question. You don't have to know how to do it, but you're going to ask the question because you're going to look at your district building assessments and look at that and say, well, well we're at the 24th percentile. Why? Why? That would be the only question you might have to ask. Look, looking at where where you are in your district snapshot, looking at your reading and math scores, and asking the question, why we're there? And then the next question, what um, we're there, what would you suggest we can do? You can't believe I was a teacher too. If somebody asked me, what can I do? What could I do as a teacher in this school to help things? I would have an idea. I always had an idea. They might not be the best ideas, but I bet every one of your teachers will have an idea. And then you put those ideas up on the board and you take a look at those things and you break them down and you talk, discuss them back and forth. And pretty soon you're going to have a plan. And it's not always gonna be, oh, we need another $500,000 to do this. It might simply be restructuring teachers from place to place. It can be a lot of different things. I don't know what's going on in your district. And some I do, because I look at these things and say, holy cow, you've got a problem. What are you doing about it? So I wish all of you would take a look at it. Again, I'm not saying schools are bad. We have some great schools and you're doing some great things, but we're not teaching reading and math at the levels that we need to teach it. And so kick it in gear, folks. Next slide. Okay, the good old bugaboo for all boards. For many, many years now, there have been some organizations that try to set up board policy to make sure that as a board member, you aren't going to be as effective as you would like to be. And it's that simple. I've seen again where well, you're not allowed to talk to an elementary teacher. You're not allowed to go into the elementary school. Again, if you are sitting there, if I'm the superintendent, you come in and you're a board member and say to me, well, I'm really concerned about our third grade reading scores, Mr. Superintendent. What do you think? And he'd say, well, I'm concerned too, you know? And the next question, well, what are we gonna do about it? It says I can't even go into the, you're telling me I can't go to the grade school to even ask a question? Well, maybe we should follow this state law and we'll all go in and ask the questions and see if we can get some answers. No board member should be restricted in asking questions of staff. And there are times, and I can see where there are misuses of this, but again, the idea and concept of this whole BNA is everybody working together. If you ask, I mean, I, I can't tell you again, I, I say it every time we talk, I will get a question from a board member and they'll say, now my superintendent won't know that I called you, will he? And my first reaction is you've got a problem in your district. If you can't sit down and talk to your superintendent, there's a problem. Guess what? You hired him. 
But I don't know personally any superintendents who won't listen to their board members. Apparently, they're out there. But all the superintendents I know, if you would walk in and ask them a question, they're going to answer it. You have a legal obligation to participate in this. If you would tell the superintendent that, I'd like, you know, again, see what he has to say. And again, if he's going to say, nope, it's only my job to do it, I'd get it in writing. And you'll have grounds for a really fun board meeting in the spring. No board member should be restricted in asking questions of staff. You should be able to talk to the staff, especially in the BNA policy. I can see again where somebody's going to say you just can't walk into the elementary school and start quizzing every staff member. No, it should be done through this process and encouraging the public to attend. The schools that have and I don't want to name a school right now. But there's one that has done such an outstanding job of really including the public in their improving reading, improving math and improving their social interactions in the school. And the entire community gets behind it. I guarantee you, if you, any school district, if you would start advertising all the things you're going to do to improve your third grade reading, and I use that a lot as an example, you would have such community buy-in. You know, you're going to get a new stadium or you're going to get, you know, your sports team going to do great. Community likes to hear that. I think they would really like to hear that you are really concerned about improving student achievement in your district. And if you all bought the, the get together, superintendents, principals, board members, you all get together, you work with your staff, and then you advertise, ask people to come, get the press in and show them things that you're actually going to do to improve it. You'll have such community buy-in and belief in what a good school district you are, you will be amazed. But it can't be the same old process of the superintendent hands you a document and that's what we're going to do. Everybody needs to be involved. Next page. Case, Kansas State Department of Education target is 75% proficient levels three and four. You're not going to get there in a few years. The achievement gaps between low income not low income, allow for grade level and subject proficiency variance. You have to look at all these things. I mean, this is a chart you can look at. Again, you have to come back down and look at each building in your district and determine specific areas that you want to work on to improve. What are the obstacles? What are the costs? What do we need to do? Who do we need to move around? What changes do we make? How can we involve the community? Then you can start working at trying to get those proficiency levels up to where every school district would like them and every parent would like them. And I know, you know, one of the fears that so many people, possibly board members, superintendents have, this information, a lot of, they don't want parents to have this. If a lot of parents saw that your school district was reading at the 30th percentile, do you think they'd be happy about that? Probably not. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why we don't share information in school districts. But if you set it up the way we're talking about tonight and follow the process, follow the law, everybody working together, you're going to find improvement. Next page. Okay, the district leadership team. We have low income students, not low income, Garden City, and, and it's we've got their math scores there. Take a look at those things. And Garden City is a unique district. They've got a lot of unique situations, but they also have some really good leadership, some good potential to really have some programs. But I, what I have not seen is where everybody is working together. Again, the board policy, the board has to be involved in these. And if the board is involved and asks the right questions and goes to some of the meetings that they're supposed to attend and actually, again, it comes down to student achievement. Is your district board meetings focusing on student achievement? What is it focusing on? I challenge all of you, sit down at your next board meeting and how many minutes are being spent on improving your student achievement? And I think you're all gonna be going, oh my gosh, we could be doing better. And if you can be doing better by following some of these procedures, by looking, if you don't look at where you are, how do you get better? You have to look and see. And you can't use these ex excuses, oh, they're, they're not right. These scores are right. They come right again from the State Department of Education. Well, they don't mean anything because we do other of these things real well. 
Yes, you do. But here's where you're being compared to every school in the state. Take a look at those things. And what area can you see on this chart that you're saying, man, I wish we would improve that. Okay, not low income in grade 10 proficient is 15%. You don't want to improve that? Yeah, I'd say you would want to improve that. And look at the drop from third grade, grade three. Look at the drop of proficient. 28% to 77, 61 to 15. I mean, there, there's some significant items that you can look at on this chart. Get your school's chart up there. You can go simply go to the building needs assessment, kansasopengov.org. Your superintendent has it. Make the charts. Determine what statistics you want to look at and how are you going to overcome the obstacles that are causing these problems to occur. It can't all be the pandemic. It can't all be bad anything. It's people not working together. So again, I implore you, look at your district, look at your scores. If you want to compare it to another, that's another good one I hear. Well, we're doing 4% better than the school down the road. Oh, good, you're at 33%. That's really wonderful. Uh, no, I don't think anybody's satisfied with that. Don't compare yourself other than look at your school district that's being compared statewide, and then you can make some good decisions. And that's what we need you to do. <coughs> Next chart, I'm gonna choke to death here. Okay, setting goals for the district leadership team. So you volunteer to be on the district leadership team. And I have had a question today a superintendent asked a couple board members to be on a district leadership team and left one off and he wanted to be on it. Can you, can I do that? Not necessarily. Any board member that really wants to be on the leadership team and sit in on some of these meetings should have the right to do so. And you don't have to have the answers, but you ask the tough questions. Examples we've given a little bit earlier, the causes of achievement decline in early grades. Why? What basic elements are missing in the curriculum? Very key, very key. There are so many curriculums out there right now. Curriculum review is a very, I, I get asked all the time, well, what's a good curriculum? Uh, that is not my decision to make. Your decision is to review curriculums and they're satisfying for the community that you're involved with. Every community is a little bit different, Mike, a little bit. But again, if board members are there, teachers are there, leadership's there, you're going to come up with a curriculum that will be satisfying to the parents of your school district because you're a board member. You are representing what? One seventh of the population of your school district. You know, do your job. Uh, what's getting in the way? DEI, for example, how do we remove those barriers? <coughs> there are always barriers that cause problems. Uh, well, Buncey is a, a, a tremendous example of what they've done to overcome uh, problems in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, in two months, we're going to feature detailed information on how you can improve those barriers in any size school district. Uh, so be sure and tune in on that one. Uh, there's also on our website, the KSBR, KSBRC website, uh, there's a Wabunsi pr presentation. You can look at that. If that's one of the barriers and that's a problem that you have identified, and set up the situation that you can do things. You know, I, and one of the school districts that really improved their reading or is working on improving their reading, when I told you about the custodian, his complaints were how messy the rooms were. And when they all got said and done, they said, okay, every day, every teacher's gonna have to pick up every, and the teachers agreed. I walked into their school district not too long ago, I got a hug from a custodian, maybe the first time in my life. Our school is so neat. Every day they are talking to their kids about responsibility of this building and how to be nice and clean and care for one another. It's just so much different now that we've addressed these situations and we're working together to make every kid happy. And I'm even, there's not as much bullying. These things can all occur if you identify them and set up the obstacles, why they're not being effective, and then set up a program of how they can be effective. And if you go into a building, and I've been in so many, when you walk in, you can tell immediately what type of building that is. It can, well, so many, there's um, last week, a beautiful, I, I walked in and I knew that was going to be a great place. Everything was clean. The first kid I walked into, hi, sir, what can I do to help you? 
Does that happen in your building? Are you training kids to do that? Uh, I shook hands with the kid as I was leaving. It was a firm handshake. I asked him, I said, where'd you learn to shake hands? He said, my dad taught me, but we reinforce it every day in third grade. I said, holy cow, how cute, how fun. But you know what? I felt great leaving that building. That kid felt great. And if you want people coming into your buildings to feel great, set up these examples that you can work on as a team. It's management's job to create a plan to produce the required outcomes with your existing resources. And simple things like working together to identify making kids happy, letting that teacher not have that one student who completely disrupts the classroom. All those things are such effective tools in making for a happier school district. So please, please get involved in your school and know what you should be doing to make these things happen. We are not that far removed in Kansas that we can't get these things done in every district. So next slide. Run productive meetings. I'm probably running, I'm gonna run out of time. Next slide. Okay, identifying the challenge, it's a problem solving, do that. No generic barriers, just talk about what the problems are. Keep politics out of it. It's, these aren't political situations. I know there are boards, four Republican, three Democrat, vice versa. We are there to improve student achievement. If every seven board members focus on that, and forget the politics, you're gonna have a better school. Be wary of topics over which schools have little control. Focus on what you can do for an issue. Now, that's a tough word for me to say. Early childhood needs, mental health, lack of parental involvement. All those things are obstacles that can be overcome if you identify them and work towards making them work in that building. Again, we're talking building by building. If there's lack of parental involvement, I guarantee you, you can find ways to get the parents into your building and get involvement. Tell them what you need. Tell them how you can most help them. It's tough in places. Single parents, more, they're all, it's a problem. But I've seen so many different solutions. If you don't know how to get parents in your school, send me a text. I'll give you a whole list of ideas and ways that you can get the parents to come into your school district. Next topic. Encourage building staff to think ahead to Q2. Barriers should be actionable with existing resources. What I've said all night long. What's the basis for this as a barrier? We have to know legitimate ones. Is there strong consensus on the barrier within the school? So in other words, you're all sitting there and you look around and you're talking about what are the barriers and the school board member says, well, I can see some of them and I think we can change it by doing this, that or the other and then a the principal might say, and then the third grade teacher might say, and then they might say, okay, we are all on the same page. You can't have 50 barriers. Identify three or four and go to work on those. And the, the, quick, the Emerson Elementary story, the staff was a barrier. When they had the meeting, the basic question was, the staff said, these kids are, are, are useless. We can't do anything with them. They hired new teachers. That's what, what the barrier was with some of the teachers. Very rare. Any, most of the teachers I know, they want to do whatever it takes, but they want support. And it, support has to come from seven board members, administration, and the building staff. Next page. Again, a repeated. You can't have one meeting and say, oh, boy, we've got the barriers. We've got a solution. See you next year. It doesn't work that way. You have to continually reinforce what you're doing. You have to basically check and see. The district staff should have a report where they can show you at a board meeting. You don't have to go to this every week, go to the elementary school or the high school or junior high, but get a report from that district staff to say, okay, here's our barriers. What have we done to improve on those barriers? What, what's going on in this district for student achievement? You know what? That would mean you'd actually be at a board meeting talking about student achievement. And I bet most of you are smiling right now thinking, yeah, that would be a rarity. If you follow the process, you're going to get these updates. And when you check, guess what happens? It continually improves. So you can't let it go and not say, I'm gonna keep checking. You know, you have to check and see what's taking place. Better go faster, next slide. Encourage staff, buy-in, we've talked about that a lot. 
agree on which of the top three or five. Again, I've said that before. We can't have too many barriers, but we do have to have some budgetary changes possibly to support the problems that you're facing. Again, these, this, these slides are all going to be up. And if you are interested in doing these things or talking to your superintendent or staff about it, use this chart and use it how you want to use it. The only thing consistent or law in this, all these slides tonight is the law. That's the one thing that's there. All these other things are ideas for you to follow, for you to take a look at and identify how you can make your school better. That's all I care about. Make your school better. Next slide. Budgetary changes. When you take a look at budgets, and again, a, a number one pet peeve last, last year, so many questions. Almost every budget that board member that contacted me, they are handed the budget and expected to sign it. And that can't really work in the BNA process. You need to have a pretty decent understanding of what's going into the budget. Because if you identify areas that you want to improve, you're going to have to spend some money in that area and maybe not so much in another area. So by really understanding your budget as a board member and looking at it is part of your responsibility. It is certainly the easier way out to just sign anything that the superintendent puts in front of you. And I know some superintendents, that's what they want. They just want you to sign. But I don't think that's, that's the way we've always done things. Again, if we're going to improve student achievement, we have to change that adult behavior. Okay, next slide. What is available in the 2024 budget? The different districts, we took a look at how much is spending per student. Again, that's a, okay, we're spending money on students. We know that, but where in the budget does this fit? And that's what board members might not necessarily see. Uh, is there something we can do to food service to make it better? Maybe that's a problem. I had one district call me two weeks ago and their food service is so bad. So many things are wrong. What can we do? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. You can follow this process in your, in your food service. Uh, identify that one cook was so bad she needed to go. Okay. Let her go. Uh, get, get a good cook, make your wages. And what can you do in your budget? Where is there extra money? to improve your food service where you're not getting constantly complained. That's not necessarily an educational improvement that we like to see, but if the kids are so unhappy and so underfed, it is a problem. It's an obstacle. And again, this is just another example of an obstacle that you might come up that you're not even thinking of. You know, you're thinking of the curriculum, you're thinking of a teacher. It might be simple as they're not well fed and they're unhappy. Uh, but identify things that you think should be improved in your school district. What are the priorities and where can we move some of the things that are not as big a priority? Hard numbers, hard numbers. I've done enough school budgets in my lifetime. There are places to find money. And uh, again, if you will all work together, guess what? You're going to find that money and uh, you'll be able, be able to effectively improve your school district. Next slide. Le legitimate budgetary changes. Develop the list of possibilities through this process. Talked a lot about it tonight. If you write the ideas on those big post-it sheets or the big whiteboards where everybody can see them and look at them, it really becomes easy to identify the different, the priority, the three budgetary changes or the, the, th the three exceptions that you want to see addressed. And when you answer that, uh, again, the district staff's going to follow up and keep you up to date on that. Next slide. And follow up discussion. Here we go. Next slide. Put a plan in place to achieve specific achievement goals. And I've said this all night long to achieve specific achievement goals with your existing resources. Allocate your staff resources, achieve the plan. Don't try to fit the plan on the existing structure. You can't try to disprove Einstein's definition of insanity for sure. The key principle, improving outcomes is number one priority. That means nothing gets in the way. Nothing. You identify what it is, and there's some examples of things that can get in the way. There's a million things that can get in the way for you to determining what you really want to accomplish. But if you don't work together as a leadership team, I don't know how you can ever come up with any ways to improve your system and your school. 
Next slide. Uh, the staff, the board determined time frame. Again, you have to set this up, and you can follow this up and check this out on and make your own adjustments to how that would be. But one week for a board study, then a series of meetings to review with staff and select the options. That's all a, a timeline that you can follow, but it's a process that has to be time driven. If you have that meeting and you actually come up with the obstacles and ways you're going to identify the obstacle, way you're going to improve those barriers, then there has to be that timeline. There has to be a follow up and it can't be a month, two months follow up. I mean, it needs to be timely the next week. Give them enough time to get the information together that you need then get together, sit down and make some decisions. And then again, check those decisions. Next page. Budgets to fulfill instruction needs for improving achievement. That's all we talk about. That's all I've talked about since I've been involved in this. Allocate the resources as needed. Where are the cost savings? Take a look at those sleets. Next slide. You can read that for yourself and follow up with, with how you see fit. But again, the objections. In every school district right now, a lot of superintendents are being told, you don't have to follow this B&A. And yet I've just read you the state law, you've seen the state law. So where are we getting off with saying you don't have to do it? And no, you know, I take this say, even if it was not a state law, would there be a better way for a school district to really look at what's going on by identifying statistically problems that you have, list those obstacles, list those solutions, and then all work together in a timely fashion? There isn't. I mean, even if it wasn't a state law, this is a process that really could improve your school district. And that's what we're all about. Next slide. And here we go. We're down to part four and I'm almost on time. Again, keeping the focus. I can't say that enough. It's building around targeting student achievement aids. It's designed to go from a specific 23, 2023 state assessment to a specific goal by the end of a specific school year. You have to be specific as what you're trying to accomplish. You might not reach it. If you don't reach that goal, you know, I've, I know one school district going through this and they've jumped it up 15%. They're going to improve 15%. And they have identified some really cool obstacles and some really good ways to, to work with those obstacles to improve the academic assessments. But 15% in one year is going to be a stretch. I hope they do it. If they do timely follow-ups all the time, there's a chance. I can't wait to see the results of this. But anybody listening tonight, and there's a lot of you out there tonight, which is exciting, but what are you doing in your district? Are you following any of these procedures? Are you going to know any, anything that's been done to improve the student achievement? Has anybody outlined anything for you? Have you had any input into it? Have you talked to any teacher about the problems that they're facing? Until the school districts that I've seen where they're, you just can't say it enough. You can walk into a building and know when you're all on the same page and when you're all working together. But many of those buildings still need to follow this process better than what they're currently doing. It just can't be administratively driven. Everybody has to be involved, including the school board. And the law states the school board shall. But you're going to be told, no, 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 you just listen to what I have to say. And I think you could find, again, if, if they're telling you that, get it in writing. Next page. Progress reports from at least one elementary, middle school, and high school principal at each board meeting. Wouldn't that be something? I, I mean, I was a principal for 20 years I made reports once in a while on different things and the board listened to them. It wasn't part of it for 20 years. It wasn't. It's the way we always did things in Kansas. And take a look. It's not working. It hasn't worked. Things are changing. We need to change with it. And all these steps, how are the student and staff reacting to some of these things? I guarantee you the schools that are doing this, the students and the staff are reacting like, thank the Lord. People care in this building. We're actually talking about student achievement. 
and about kids getting along with one another and about teachers being helped. You develop, develop that type of thing, then it's so easy. I mean, you will get more community support when they identify that you're a school district that is really working on student achievement. They will line up to help you achieve your goals. Problem you might have is most first identifying how can they best help. So before you ask, maybe you should identify how any club organization that you're going to reach out to, what you really want them to do and how can they really help. And so I'll throw out, talk to a school the other day, they, they found 10, they have 10 volunteers for every day of the week that are willing to come in and work with a student if they're causing problems. And the community bought into it. It's not like, oh, we can't do that. That's against the law. Everybody bought into it. We're going to do the, our best to improve student achievement. Now, I get fired up. Excuse me, folks. <laughs> Next slide. And are we out of slides or did blank off? You We're are. Done. You're out of slide. We got to the end. You made your way through. I tried to go fast. And folks, I again, I, I uh, get pretty fired up because this is a pretty good system that you could be following to really improve student achievement in your district. Again, I would really encourage you to go to the KSBRC website. Every board member should watch AJ Crable's presentation that's on there. Then every board member should again follow this process. And if you can get this involved in your school, I, I will bet you anything that you want to bet, folks, you can improve your school district. Tonight, we're going to have, we have some questions and what we will try to do, if you have listed any, any questions in a chat, we will record them and get them directly to you because we have your email. Or you can call me tomorrow if you want to. My phone number is on the website. Call Tracy. Uh, she and I are in this together, work beautifully together. She's a very smart young lady, uh, a lot nicer than I am, so maybe you want to call her. But uh, I, we are in it to improve student achievement. That is our only goal. Whatever anybody else wants to tell you, that's not what we're here for. We are here to try to help you guys do the job that we need to get done in Kansas. So with that, Tracy, I don't have anything else. Uh, if you want to finish up, go right ahead. Well, thank you so much for walking us through that. I think that sometimes when we look at the, you know, these scores have been declining since 2015. And so sometimes it seems just daunting and like overwhelming to think how in the world can we improve that? Or that there are so many problems that we're just not able to identify anything. And so we just continue to do the same things that we've always done, just as Ward said. Um, and I appreciate this building needs assessment because it is a really um, simple process to be able to bring everyone together and focus on what the priority is um, for students. And that, you know, for those, for those of us who are parents, grandparents, I know that school board members, um, you run because you care about the student, you care about your community. And you want students to do well. You want them to be able to go out and be these wonderful citizens and achieve all their goals and be able to support their families and, and you know, be able to achieve all their dreams. So I think this building needs assessment will be able to turn around. It's not going to happen tomorrow, as Ward said, but it certainly is a path towards success. So if you do have questions, we have a Q&A, uh, but we'll be able to record those if we're not able to um be able to answer those here. We have about five minutes left, but it, so if you want to put a question into the Q and A, um, and so Ward, here is a question for you. Um, this individual said that. Um, do you think that social workers can contribute to this discussion? of removing barriers to education, what kind of current or past policies contribute to perpetuating the problems mentioned during this meeting? So do you think that there are social workers that would be able to, to help, to be able to support? And if, are there any specific things that you could think that have you know, happened that has um, contributed to the issues that we see? Well, yeah, I, we, we mentioned the pandemic certainly, uh, the isolation of students. Uh, I saw a study today where the, the, the amount of students 12 to 17, the amount of depressants that uh, has, has increased uh, 
threefold since since that time. Uh, social workers, there are some school districts that associate with social workers. There are some great ones. Again, when you sit down and, and talk, if you're identifying that you have a lot of problems and you need some more help with counselors or social work, again, identify how can you get that help? And what can you do? And again, a, a system that I've seen where everybody is working, like the Wabansi, where every day they talk good character development, first period, and the kids lead it and they talk about it. When you're doing things like that, there can be a significant improvement. But again, social workers can play a part, but they can also be a stigma. So again, I think that's where your staff sits down and everybody works and plans together. If you have social work on staff, they're aware of what's going on, ask them for their input. Great. And I, I want to throw out anybody else listening. If you, we're going to have these webinars every month. If they have some specific questions or topics that they would like, I think next month we are going to do, uh, oh, Labor negotiations with Labor John negotiations. Berner. And, uh, He's an expert in that field. He's an attorney with Bolston Siefkin, and he will be able to lead us through some of those navigating um, through the uh, negotiations and contract negotiations for everyone involved. And if you have other topics after that, please let us know, because we are trying to put together programs or information that uh, you don't have to, that we can get out to a lot of people. Well, Ward, I'm going to ask you in the last about five minutes that we have, here's a question. It's a really great question. If the board is doing the building needs assessment, it's a public meeting and subject to coma, correct? Correct. Yeah, if there's board members involved, I believe very much so. It's, it's subject to coma. And that's okay. Yeah, and I think that one of the beautiful things or one of the, I think there's an advantage to the building needs assessment is that it really involves a broad range of people. So you're going to have a lot in within asking those questions, you're going to have a lot of buy-in. You're going to have people who understand that you really care about student achievements, student success, and that everybody's working toward helping their children to become even more successful. So I think the process even of itself really um, is a collaborative one and contributes to that. Yeah, I, uh, the question is going to come up and we're going to try and uh, I will get a more clear answer to that. But you can't have 400 people in the room doing this. Right. You know, there has to be a, a group of people that that should be there. I don't think all these have to they don't have to necessarily be open to the entire public. Uh, but I think you have to tell them that you're doing it, too. So. Uh, but we haven't run into any problems with that yet. The only problem I've seen with that is when a superintendent told a board member he couldn't attend. And I don't think they can do that. Any other last minute questions? We're closing in on the last three minutes, and I guess we can give you those last three minutes back. But please join us again at the end of March for our next webinar. It's on our website, the KSBRC website under the events page. We'll be setting up that registration here at the end of this week, beginning of next week. So you can register for that and navigating the conversations of contract negotiation, labor negotiation with Donald Berner from Fulston Siefkin, um, a partner at Sulkin, Fulston Siefkin um, Attorneys. Great. And don't forget to send us your question. And again, this is all on our website. You can see what we said tonight and you can see all these slides. And I would say if you need some support, that's what we're here for. So if we can help you come to your district and help you work through this process and get this process set up, then Ward and I would be happy to do that for you. You make the decisions on how the obstacles that you have and how you're going to um, overcome those obstacles, but we'll be there to support you through the process. I guess we can close. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, big, Ward. Big crowd tonight. Thank you, everybody.